is over. See how the war was won. a and &E examines the ground assault, part of our continuing series, Operation Desert Storm. February 1991, a coalition of allied nations launched a massive ground assault against Iraqi army units occupying Kuwait. In a ground campaign lasting a scant 100 hours, the fourth largest army in the world was decisively defeated. Waged for the most part in trackless desert, the Gulf War was dominated by high-tech weapons. This program examines the new weapons of the ground campaign as well as the military objectives of the field commanders. And it chronicles the final battles that brought Desert Storm to its victorious conclusion. In November 1990, President George Bush decided to increase the scale of United States forces stationed in Saudi Arabia. What had been a force structure suitable for defending Saudi Arabia from any further Iraqi aggression would become a force structure suitable for destroying the Iraqi army in the Kuwait theater. It would take over two months to move these forces from bases in Europe and the United States to the Gulf. America's Gulf allies, including Britain, also began reinforcing their own forces. Until November, American ground forces in the Gulf had been centered on two main elements, the Army's 18th Airborne Corps and the Marine Corps' expeditionary forces. The 18th Airborne Corps was configured to be light and easy to move, sacrificing firepower for transportability. It was based around three divisions, the 82nd Airborne, a paratrooper division, the 101st Air Assault, a Hellebore Infantry Division, and the 24th Mechanized, a heavy infantry division with a substantial armor force. The Marine divisions also shared an accent on strategic mobility. Even with the Allied coalition forces added, these initial American formations were believed to be insufficient to liberate Kuwait. President Bush's November decision would lead to the deployment of the Army's heavy maneuver forces to the Gulf. The primary U.S. Army formation would be the 7th Corps, normally based in Germany. The 7th Corps would bring with it three armored divisions, a mechanized infantry division, and substantial corps formations. These divisions were all heavy maneuver units, difficult to transport, but possessing substantially more combat power and tactical mobility than the forces already in the Gulf region. A unique difference between the American Maneuver Division and their Iraqi opponents was the helicopter. The U.S. Army Maneuver Divisions were equipped with their own helicopter forces, including a substantial force of attack helicopters. Iraqi Army forces had no significant helicopter force. The principal British Army unit in the Gulf, the 1st Armored Division, was a heavy armor formation much like its American counterpart. The French Duguay force was also a mechanized formation, but smaller and more modestly equipped than either the United States or British Army divisions. The Arab forces of the coalition included substantial armor forces. Besides the Saudi Army tank brigades, Egypt dispatched a mechanized and tank division, and Syria contributed a tank division. There were armored forces as well from Qatar and Kuwait. Both the Egyptian and Syrian armor forces had seen combat decades earlier in their wars with Israel. The dominant land weapon in modern desert warfare has been the tank. This would be the case in the Gulf War. The majority of Iraqi tanks were older Chinese Type 59s, or the similar Soviet T-55s. The best Iraqi tanks, the T-72s, were used by the Republican Guard. U.S. Army tank formations, although outnumbered, were much better equipped than their Iraqi counterparts. In the early 1980s, the U.S. Army had completely revamped its armored force. 
the older M60 tank had given way to the vastly improved M1 Abrams. There is no tank on the battlefield anywhere in the world, certainly not on this battlefield, that even comes close to matching the M1A1 heavy armor. I mean, and that's not a hope, that's just a, an analysis of capabilities of equipment. The M1A1 Abrams had advantages in nearly every category over its best Iraqi opponent, the T-72. It was more thickly armored. During the subsequent fighting, the M1 tanks were hit on several occasions by Iraqi T-72s, but without a single tank being knocked out. In contrast, the Abrams 120mm gun, combined with a more advanced fire control system, allowed the Abrams to engage and destroy Iraqi tanks at long ranges before the Iraqi tanks were effective. The British counterpart of the M1A1 Abrams is the Challenger tank, which had many of the same advantages over Iraqi tanks as its American cousin. Not all of the Allied tanks were state-of-the-art. The older American M60A1 tank was used by most Marine units as well as the Saudi and Egyptian armies. The French used the AMX 30B2 a modernized version of a tank first deployed in 1960. The Syrians used the T-62 tank, much the same type of tank as the Iraqis themselves. One of the most significant advantages enjoyed by Allied vehicles over their Iraqi counterparts was their use of more sophisticated night vision systems. This would play a significant role in the upcoming battles. Allied tanks could fight at night or in poor weather conditions when the Iraqi tanks were virtually blind. Obviously, we'd rather conduct defensive operations at night, taking advantage of our night vision devices, taking advantage of our ability to move undetected and uh, get in behind enemy lines and disrupt their ability to conduct uh, the defense. So we'd rather use the night to our advantage. Probably the greatest Allied advantage in tanks was not in the tanks themselves, but in the quality of their crews. What the Gulf War would show was that tank fighting demanded more than simply good equipment. The training and skill of the tank crews would prove central to the performance of tanks in combat. The companion to the tank on the modern battlefield is the infantry fighting vehicle. In contemporary tank warfare, the infantry rides into battle within the armored hull of a fighting vehicle. The infantry can dismount near the battle line to carry out its traditional combat missions. The armored infantry transporter allows the infantry to keep up with the tanks and gives the infantry protection against enemy small arms fire and artillery air bursts. Current infantry vehicles, such as the U.S. Army's Bradley, are much better armed than infantry transporters of the past, usually carrying an automatic cannon and an anti-tank missile. Infantry mobility would be a prime requirement in any upcoming desert land campaign. Distances in the desert are vast, and the infantry needed a vehicle capable of moving them at the same pace as the tanks and other vehicles. We continue with Operation Army to cause much concern was the artillery force. To deal with Iraqi artillery, the Allied forces had a wide variety of weapons. Iraqi artillery was a special focus of air attack and counter-battery fire from Allied artillery. The self-propelled 155mm howitzer was the staple weapon of the Allied artillery units. Although it could be outranged by many Iraqi guns, superior fire direction and intelligence would more than compensate. Artillery is no longer a contest of gun barrels alone. 
Targets must be accurately located and identified. The U.S. Army and Marine Corps had several innovations to help in this respect. RPVs, remotely piloted vehicles, were used by the ground forces and the Navy to help find Iraqi artillery and other targets and help correct the aim of the gun. computerized command and control could accentuate these intelligence advantages for the artillery. If an armed force, particularly a ground armed force in this case, is going to be effective, then the key to that effectiveness is being able to marshal all your combat power uh, at the key time, at the key place. Uh, the way we collect the intelligence analyze it, process it, and then make uh, key decisions about enemy intentions uh, at this site allows the division commander to do just that, uh, to focus his combat power, and in the process of focus focusing it, overwhelm the enemy in front of him. New technology also added to the arsenal of the Desert Shield Coalition. The MLRS, Multiple Launch Rocket System, could reach further than any Iraqi gun. It was designed specifically to deal with enemy artillery concentrations. Uh, the MLRS is primarily an area fire weapon system. Um, uh, we have three crew members in each of the launchers. Uh, and on each of the launchers, uh, we have 12 rockets. Uh, we can expend all 12 of those rockets and all of the submunitions uh, in less than a minute. Uh, so we get a, uh, a huge volume of firepower in a very short period of time. I think we would probably be used uh, primarily in a counterfire role that is shooting against his artillery, um, or in any type of target where we had a, uh, a large area type target that we wanted a, a large volume of fire in a very short period of time. As we see in this test footage, the small submunitions blanket a wide area. The MLRS proved very successful in countering the threat of the more numerous Iraqi artillery force. The one advantage enjoyed by the Iraqi army was the time it had to prepare for the Allied onslaught. The Iraqis could build up tank ditches, fire traps, and other barriers like those we see here. And to limit the mobility of the Allied maneuver divisions, mines could be laid along the frontier and in front of key Iraqi positions. There is no easy remedy for mines. The most important way to limit the mine threat was training. This mine was the Afghan Freedom Fighters mine of choice, it's called a TC-6. What the Afghans wanted was something that would take a Soviet tank and like toss it six feet in the air and screw everybody up in it. Italians came out with this mine. It's very effective. He's got about 100,000 of these. He's also got the E variant, which you can turn on, turn off like a garage door opener. Okay? He's also got an anti handling device. This is starting to get in the state of the art. Okay? Real good. More expensive, though. A couple hundred bucks. He's got a bunch of these. Okay, you roll over one of these, it's bad news. He's got massive quantities of these Italian mines. He likes. Valmar 69, this is a very effective mine. Three and a half million of these, jumps up 20, you know, jumps up about this high with a lanyard, goes off, everything dies within 20 meters. Number one buckshot. Very effective, very good. There is no pause. You know, the old days in Vietnam where you saw all those wild books where the guy stepped on a mine and just stayed there. That don't happen, okay? When you step on one of these, you're dead. In spite of the sophistication of the Allied equipment, Mine warfare and other combat engineer techniques was one of the few areas where the U.S. Army was found wanting. Combat engineering has not been, in the offensive role, one of the West's priorities. Large reason for this was in the 1980s, we thought of ourselves as being on the defensive, that we would be defending against a Soviet thrust into Europe and we didn't think it very important that we would be penetrating minefields. We thought it much more important that we learned how to put down our own minefields very quickly. Uh, so this really didn't get the emphasis. 